Warning, some contents may be disturbing. Viewer discretion is advised. I've never really shared this story before, mainly because it still causes me mental distress every time that I think about it, even all these years later. But after reading a bunch of other stories posted in this group and seeing that a lot of people have gone through terrible things, some of them even similar to mine, I decided that I should put it out there and see if it helps me get past it. Maybe it will help others see the severity of obsessive behavior, and if it helps anyone, that would be an added bonus in my mind. Back when I was in high school, there was this kid named Carter who was always a bit odd and out there. He was quiet, very quiet. He kept to himself for the most part, but he had a bit of a fascination with me, in that where he never really spoke to anyone else. He always treated me like I was a good friend, like we talked all the time. Now, I didn't mind Carter. He seemed like an okay person, but outside of that, I never really paid much attention to him, assuming that he was just shy and that he might have a bit of a crush on me or something. I figured that it was completely harmless and that it would pass and that would be that. However, of course, that's not how things went. What started as him just having that small crush turned into him getting a bit creepy. He started seeming to always be around, seemingly by coincidence. He'd be in the hallways nearby when I walked to class, and at lunch, he would sit at the table next to where I was regardless of who was sitting there, or he would stand with his back against the wall near the table if there were people already there. He joined the drama club randomly, and he would be there every day after school when the meetings would occur. I just tried to pretend that it had nothing to do with me, and that I was just noticing a bunch of coincidental occurrences, and that he wasn't doing it to be around me. But then... The note started. There was a random note in my locker one day, handwritten, and not signed, and it was filled with a bunch of compliments and declarations of love. Flattering, sure, but it was cringe-inducing too. It had compliments about random things that really didn't make sense to me, like the straightness of my teeth and how I walked, and, of course, that wasn't the only one. Oh no, it happened every single day for a few days. Then, a few days where there were multiples, and it just started getting beyond unsettling. They started to mention details about my life that no one should have known. Specifically, one mentioned the color of the underwear that I was wearing that day, and how it matched the color of my bed covers. Worse yet... It was completely accurate. When I read that, I started to feel sick in my stomach, realizing that this guy was stalking me. I could no longer pretend that it was all a coincidence. I had to accept and address that this boy was pushing boundaries. I will say that I was only 16, and I really didn't know what to do about it beyond telling an adult. And I figured that I should tell my school counselor since it was technically happening at school. So, I went to my counselor and I explained everything that was going on and I gave her those notes, including those last ones that I mentioned. She read them and after getting through it and taking a few minutes to think about it, she looked at me and said, And you think that you know who sent these? I told her that it was Carter, and she asked me how I knew for sure. I tried to explain that he was stalking me, that he was always around and such, but she mentioned that none of those letters were signed, and that I couldn't just accuse him without being able to prove it. I asked how I was supposed to prove it, and she just shrugged me off, saying that as serious as this sounded, 
There was nothing to show that it was actually him and that I should talk to him about it. She seriously recommended that I talk to him about this whole thing and that I talk to him about how obsessive he was about the fact that he had obviously been peeping in my bedroom window at some point. That wasn't going to happen, obviously. So I walked out of that room, and I finished my day, and when I got home, I just went and lay down in my bed and sobbed. I was feeling paranoid, freaked out, like he was watching me while I was sitting there crying. I kept glancing out of my window thinking that I would see him, thinking that he would be right there for some reason. Now, when my dad got home, he asked me what was going on, and I explained the whole thing to him, and I even told him that I tried to talk to my school counselor and that she basically told me that she couldn't do anything about it. He was shocked and angry, and when I told him about the counselor and he read the part about how he was looking in my room, he became absolutely furious. He told me that he was going to talk to the counselor the next morning. And so the next day, he drove me to school, and he went in to talk to her. And when he came out, it was pretty clear that everyone was unhappy. He told me that I was going to be staying home from school that day, and then we left. When we got home, he told some of what was said, and he mentioned that the counselor was going to have a conversation with Carter and said things would be okay. The day when I went back, I was nervous that I was going to run into Carter in the hallways. But from what I could tell, he wasn't at school, which made me feel a bit better. Well, that is, until I got home. When I got home from school, as was normal, my parents weren't home. So I went in, grabbed something to eat, and then I sat in the living room to watch some TV. After about 20 minutes, I heard something in the garage like something had fallen down, and without even thinking, I got up to see what exactly it was. When I opened the door, my heart dropped. There, in the middle of the garage, was Carter just standing there trying to pick up what he had knocked down. He looked up at me and gave me this horrible grin and then immediately started toward the door. Thankfully, there were two things that were going to be my saving grace. The door upstairs from the garage had a deadbolt lock on it and my dad was going to be home within only a couple of minutes. So I slammed the door and I locked it with a deadbolt and knob lock and after a couple of minutes... I could hear Carter smacking the door and telling me that I needed to let him in and that he loved me and that I needed to let him be close to me. With the door locked, there was only one way out of the garage and that was through the garage door, which was now opening because my dad was pulling in. I heard my dad pulling into the garage and I heard the door open and I heard my dad shouting at Carter, yelling at him to get on the ground, and Carter said that he wasn't there to do anything wrong. That would have been believable had he not somehow broken into the garage to wait for me to get home. A bit after this, my dad told me to call the police and tell them that Carter had broken into our home. So long story short, the police did show up. I explained what had happened and that I had come home and found him in the garage. After a lot of talking to the cops and then putting Carter into the back of the car, I was just sitting there and staring at him in the back of the police car as they asked questions and got more info. The police then pulled off and I had never been happier than that day. Thankfully, that was pretty much the end of it. I don't know how far into the legal system Carter ended up getting, but I never saw him at school again. Obviously, I never got another note in my locker, and I never had to deal with his craziness again, and my life got back on track almost immediately. I'm thankful that my dad took me seriously, and screw that counselor for not even thinking to address the whole thing beyond saying, 
Oh, we can't prove it. And Carter, I'm glad that you and I never met again and stay the hell away from me. Back when I was younger, my mom had a garage sale every summer. I had three older brothers and I was the only girl, so hand-me-downs weren't really a thing for me. So after my last brother couldn't fit into the clothes or shoes anymore, they were in the sale. I honestly enjoyed helping my mom on these, as it was like playing a real-life shopkeeper. I used to play that with my brothers a lot as kids. I also had the genius idea, like a lot of kids did, to sell lemonade and cookies too. When I got a little older, I think I was around 14 or 15, I was always trying to make my own money. So when my mom offered to give me the money that I made on my stuff, I agreed to sell a lot more. I had some old clothes that I didn't want to get rid of, even though they didn't fit me or even if they were torn up. They held good memories, so I didn't want to part with it. I also had some toys that I didn't play with that I kept for similar reasons. My mom did not like the clutter, so any extra stuff that wasn't necessary, she always tried to get rid of. So, I pulled out all of those stuff that I didn't need anymore, and she set up a table specifically for my stuff and they had all the pink stickers on it, so that we knew that it belonged to me. Well, I was ready to collect shopping funds. The sale started slow, but it was alright. I sat out there by the cash box, typically doing stuff on my phone, while my mom organized and put more stuff out, and mingled with the neighborhood shoppers. But at one point, there was a guy that showed up alone in a small convertible. He looked normal. He was in jeans and a t-shirt and just slowly made his way to each table and bin that my mom had set out. He paused at the box of my dad's stuff, which I think had some old tools and shoes in it. And then, he walked by the table that had my brother's clothes on it. He picked up a couple pairs of pants and it looked like he checked the sizes and then he folded them back up and laid them on the table. The next table had my mom's clothes and my clothes on it. He again picked up a few items, and one of those was a pair of my old jeans. I remember him holding them out and looking them up and down, almost as if he was inspecting them. Then, he flipped them over to the back and kind of smirked. I figured that it was because the back had something written across the pockets like Angel. He looked around and noticed that I was making eye contact with him, and then he smiled. I smiled back, but then I quickly looked back down at my phone, thinking that it was awkward of me to stare. I knew it had been a few minutes because I had been watching a video that I was in the middle of. He walked over to me, and said hello, and I responded. He asked if I was the manager, joking around, and I said that my mom was, but that I was just watching over as she got more stuff. He asked a few innocent questions about the day and about me, but it was nothing weird, so I just answered. I remember even making a comment about his car because I thought it looked very cool. It was a deep purple color, he looked over at the car, then back at me, and smiled, and said since I like it, he could take me for a drive in it if I wanted to. Now, even though he didn't seem weird and nothing felt off, I knew better so I just smiled and said thanks, but no thanks. He then asked if I was selling any of my stuff, and I confirmed. I pointed to the table as he had already looked at my pants. I also remember this because I felt my stuff was pretty obvious. My mom was out there when he got there, and it's pretty obvious that we were two different sizes. The tables were also sorted out by the type of clothing and sizing, as my mom was a neat freak. So he smiled again, thanking me, 
and then walk back over to the table with my stuff. I stuck a few glances up from my phone to see him still looking at my clothes. I thought that it was kind of weird that he was looking at my clothes and no one else's. But I also tried to be reasonable in thinking that maybe he had a daughter around the same age too. But then, the guy came back over to me and had a few more questions. This time, they seemed a bit more intrusive. He asked how old I was, and I answered honestly. He asked me how tall I was, and I again was honest. But then he asked me what size I wore, which was weird because if I told you where my clothes were, you could check the sizes on them and assume that I'm probably around that size. So, I just told him the same size on the pants that he was holding. He kind of laughed a bit, and I guess he could sense my uneasiness and claimed that he was thinking about his daughter. I thought it was still possible, so I just tried to be polite, but I was also feeling awkward at this point. He stood there for a moment, so I was expecting him to walk away, but instead, he leaned down towards my face, looked around, and then quietly asked, Are you getting rid of any old sports bras? I wanted to yell at this guy, but I was also afraid that he might try to do something. If he was brazen enough to ask me that with other people around, what else would he be willing to do? However, my dad was in the garage behind me talking to someone as I could hear his voice, so I decided to take a chance and call this guy out. No, I'm not selling my underwear to you, you creep! I loudly shouted. This was the exact reaction I was hoping for. I looked back at my dad who was already quickly walking towards the front, and the guy dropped the items he was holding on the table in front of me and started walking away and looked at another table. He really thought that he was going to be able to play the whole situation off. My dad immediately approached him, shoved him back a bit, and then told him to leave. No questions, no nothing. He just told him to get the hell out of our property right there. The guy walked back to his car, holding his hands up and looked offended like my dad was in the wrong. He quickly burned out while other shoppers looked around at him and started asking questions. I explained to my dad what happened and he made my oldest brother sit out there with me while he went in and told my mom about what happened. He didn't want me out there alone, nor did I want to be alone. It wasn't even that long after that they both came back out the front door. We were all talking and helping people pay and leave. When I looked up, to see a purple convertible driving by real slowly. Before I could even say anything, my dad looked up too and noticed and shouted something out to the guy, causing him to again take off. My brother was ready to go follow this guy in his own car, but my dad stopped him. Instead, he did call the cops to report him, which we did. They said they would drive around a few times, but said that if we saw him again, to call 911 immediately and they could patch him to one of the officers so they could try to stop him if he was out front. At this point, he was being intimidating, and with what he said to me, and the fact that he was bordering on trespassing, they took it very seriously. We ended up putting all our stuff away early because we didn't want to give that guy something to look at, but we didn't see him again that day. However, my mom was going to try the sale again the next day, but I didn't want to be out there, so I ended up staying inside and cleaned and organized my room. And yet... The same creep drove by again. I was getting pretty worried about this. And every bump that night had me wide awake thinking that this guy was going to come back. My dad was getting pretty angry too. He ended up sitting in his car, parked on the street across from my house, and waited for that guy to drive by. My room faces out into the front yard, so I could hear him talking to my mom and brother about it while my window was open and could see him sitting in his car. 
I guess that must have really spooked the guy because he was brave enough to drive by one more time and my dad was ready to follow him. I heard my mom shout and the convertible guy burned out again and then my dad followed them. We had more cops over as my mom explained to them what happened. I don't remember how long it was when my dad finally came back. He said that he followed him for a while until he got on the highway going some pretty dangerous speeds. My dad wasn't willing to humor that, so he slowed down and then came back home. As far as I know, they never caught the guy, but we never saw him again after that. The conversation that I had with him was creepy enough, but knowing that he was driving past our home, not only on the day of, but the day after that encounter, was pretty disturbing. It still creeps me out thinking about what his intentions were, but thankfully, we never saw him again after that. I just hope that he didn't try to do that or anything else to another unsuspecting girl. A few years ago, I used to live in an apartment complex that was attached to a really nice public park. One that was surrounded entirely with a walking path that broke away at one part to go into a wooded area. I've walked this park hundreds of times, like literally hundreds of times. I used to walk that park every single day after work for a couple of years. It was one of the safest places that I've ever walked and honestly, I never expected anything to happen to me while I walked it. But the day that this happened, my illusion of how safe it was, was definitely shattered. I was about halfway through my usual route, which included about half of the branch path that took me out into the forest. I didn't like to do the whole thing because it went too far out for me, but I would go until I reached the benches, which would be the halfway mark, and then I would turn around to head home. I was minding my own business when I started to get this weird feeling like someone was watching or following me. You know, that creepy crawling sensation that just makes the hair on the back of your neck stand up. I just tried to shake it off, thinking that I was just a bit anxious or that maybe there was a person there, but they were just walking too. But after a few more minutes... I started to feel a bit worse. I was thinking that I was being paranoid. Until I turned around and saw that there was a guy that was standing on the side of the path, looking around like he had lost something. But then every few moments, he would glance up in my direction. He was a bit overweight, wearing a white and green tracksuit. I slowed down as I walked and half turned to look at the guy and make sure that he knew that I saw him. And as soon as I did, this guy stopped looking at the ground and then stood straight up, gave me a small wave and said, Oh, hey. I didn't reply. I just stood where I was and I gave a small wave back. And as soon as I did, he nodded and then he laughed and then started stepping towards me at an escalated pace. My instincts kicked in, and I took off down the path, starting at a medium run, but when I looked back and saw that this guy was now chasing me as fast as he could, I took off into a full sprint. For a few moments, this guy was running at me, and I was running away. Thankfully, I was definitely faster than he was, as I was able to get back to the part of the path that branched off. I ducked down into some of the thicker bushes, hiding and seeing if this guy was going to follow me this far. And after a couple more seconds, he actually did run down to the split, and he slowed down to a walk as he caught his breath and then tried to look around. I just sat there, I ducked down into these bushes, feeling my heart pound so hard that I thought I might throw up, watching the sky look around the paths. And then, 
I heard something that completely confirmed all of my fears. He pulled his phone out of his pocket, pressed the button on the screen, and started talking. I couldn't make out the full conversation, but I heard enough to know that this situation was as terrifying as I thought it was. He said, Hey, yeah, yeah, I lost her. His voice was frustrated and angry, and I knew for a fact, had I not gotten away from this guy, bad things would have happened. After a few more words, he hung up and yelled a few curse words out into the woods, and then he slowly walked back the way that he had came. I stayed hidden in those bushes for a while until it clicked in my mind that I should probably call 911. I pulled out my phone and dialed it, and I explained to them that there was a guy on the walking path that had been chasing me, and I also explained what he had said on the phone. The woman said that they would send some police out to the park and to meet them there if possible. I got out of the hiding spot when I was certain that he was in fact gone from there, and then I walked back toward my building. I waited in the parking lot of the property for a while, and in an incredibly disappointing twist, the police never showed up. Well, my guess is that they got a call that was more important than the weird men followed me in the park, but I would have at least liked a callback or something. But of course, that didn't happen. The whole thing really messed me up, and I never was back to that park. I ended up taking my walks around the parking lot of my apartment complex because I just couldn't bring myself to go back into those woods just in case. It's scary to think about what might have happened had he gotten a hold of me, but thankfully, that didn't happen at all. I have no idea what happened and honestly, I hope that no one ever ended up in the situation that I did. And I hope that I never run into him ever again. And to everyone else, be careful, stay aware, because you never know who might be watching. This happened towards the end of my senior year of high school, and unfortunately, is something that was just as memorable as the rest of the year. I will not be sharing my location or school, and any names that I use will be fake because, technically, I was not the victim here, so I don't want to invade their privacy any more than I already have. But I still feel that it's important to share this story as a way of helping others and to stress the importance of, if you see something, say something. I don't know if it's the same for other high schools, but it was quite common for the seniors to pull some kind of massive prank on the school as a whole. They were supposed to be harmless. It was like a universal rule so that no one got kicked out or suspended. It was also typically done around spring break, giving them time to execute it. So, to keep with the tradition, several of us seniors, including myself, started plotting our scheme. The school was going to look like a glitter bomb went off in it. We had tons of glitter and confetti that we had just bought from random party stores and a few bulk bags on eBay for a stupidly cheap, possibly shady price. One of my friends, I'll call Jess, was our golden ticket as she was a teacher's aide, which meant he had access to the room that had all the spare keys to the classrooms. We started the day before spring break started. There were a lot of teachers and faculty there as they were probably wrapping things up for the break, so we waited outside in one of our cars while Jess went in to look like he was working on some last-minute things for a teacher. After a few hours, people started slowly leaving, so he let us in through the south door and then ushered us into different rooms to fulfill our plan. It started out completely smooth. We got through several classrooms, almost ran into one teacher, 
but managed to hide from them. We all even got a good laugh about it, too. And then, we came across the classroom of Mr. Jackson. Mr. Jackson was the media teacher, and he was actually pretty cool. I guess when it's an elective, we tend to like those more anyways, right? The class was awesome. We made different media-related projects, such as our own radio broadcast. We recorded and put together a new session, including local and national news topics, some sports, and also the weather. It was actually a lot of fun and interesting, as Mr. Jackson used a lot of his own equipment. So we were working with some very expensive and high-tech cameras. We had microphones, and even the software was pretty advanced. Mr. Jackson was laid back too and easy to talk to when it came to anything from the assignments to more personal things. He was a bit of a prankster himself. When he caught someone sleeping, he would do harmless things such as having us all leave the room, turn the lights off, and have them wake up confused. Like I said, pretty harmless. So when we came across this room, I didn't want to do anything to the equipment, but I wanted to do something additional or extra to his room, knowing that he would appreciate the prank. I started looking around the room to get some ideas of what to do when I started going through his desk. In the bottom drawer, I found several tapes similar to the ones we used for our projects. In fact, I recognized the names of some of my classmates on them. However, I found two tapes that only had a label of Class of 92. This caught my attention because at that time of this event, it was not the year 92 or 93 or even the 90s for that matter. My curiosity was now piqued and I decided to take one with me, thinking either I can use it for the prank or maybe it was a memorable class and I could do something special for him as a farewell slash graduation gift. In regards to the prank, I just covered his desk with glitter and filled one of the tape cabinets with it too. I had two friends with me in that room that saw me with the tape and wanted to know what was on it as well, so I agreed to let them know or watch it with them if they wanted to. We left the school that evening with a successful mission and then we agreed to watch the tape the next day at my place since I had a VCR in my room. However, I couldn't stop thinking about the tape and what could be on it or what could be so important to keep that specific year. So, I decided to watch it that night. I would just let my friends see it the next day. I know you all have probably already figured out where this is going, but to this day, I still fight myself if taking that tape was the right thing to do. The tape started during what appears to be a graduation ceremony, then cuts to that same classroom. The room was almost completely empty. A few people walked past the camera, and you could hear the door close. What was still on the camera was a girl in the second row from the front. Then, I watched Mr. Jackson walk by the camera towards the door, then started talking as he walked towards the girl. There was some innocent conversation occurring at first. He asked her how she was doing, how her older sister was, and even what her plans were for winter break. But then, the conversation changed to the homework or projects. She shyly asked him about how to do something, and he pulled out another camera as well as a sheet, and then started explaining it. But while this was happening, is where my stomach started to drop. I saw Mr. Jackson place his hand on her knee, then said something quietly to her. I could see their faces, and she definitely did not seem interested in this or reciprocated in any way. There was some more one-sided conversation while his hand moved from her knee to her thigh. I was frozen with fear and disgust, and about 20 minutes, the tape cut back to the ceremony 
and there was nothing else after that. It was pretty obvious what this was, and the ceremony was used as a mask. I was terrified. I knew Mr. Jackson, and in fact, I knew the girl in the video. We had a different class together, but I was only an acquaintance with her, really. But I did have a friend that was pretty close to her. I didn't know what to do or who to show this to, since we technically shouldn't have been in the school at that time. I was still a kid, so I didn't know if I would get in trouble if I told them. Instead, I tried to ask my mutual friend to talk to her, but I tried to be vague, not wanting to talk about the situation. My mutual friend, Katie, did not take the media class, so I asked her to ask the girl about the class, ask her if she had any troubles and how she felt about the teacher or assignments. And the next day, Katie asked me if I was having troubles in the class because of the girl's reaction. She said that she thought the class was okay, but when she asked about the teacher, she got quiet and didn't want to talk about it, so she assumed that she wasn't doing well in it. The feeling of something being very wrong only got heavier in my mind. It was still spring break at that time, so I could only dwell on it. I even admitted to my friends that I tried watching it, but that something was wrong and it didn't work. I didn't want them to see it for their and more importantly for her sake. When we did return to school, I found myself watching him more closely and realized that he was the same as I remembered him. Except, I saw him glance over at the girl many times throughout the hour that we were in class. That night, when I went home, I told my parents everything. I told them about how I found the tape and what was on the tape. I gave it to them, but I don't know if they ever watched it. I assume they did, because what I accused the teacher of was very real and very serious. I can be quite the jokester and always try to keep the conversation lighthearted. This was not something I would even bring up in a joking matter, so I'm sure my parents trusted me on that front too. And they told me that they would take care of it and just to go to school as normal. The rest of that week, I tried my best to act normal, but it was hard to not want to go off on Mr. Jackson. It was hard not to want to go to that girl and tell her that I was sorry for what she went through. But I didn't. And thankfully, I only had to go two days like that. On the third day, we had a substitute teacher, and everyone took it at face value that we were just getting a free day. But I think I knew the real reason. The rest of the week continued with the same sub, and then we were told the next week that Mr. Jackson wouldn't be able to finish the school year. I was so relieved but also concerned as the girl wasn't in the class the next week either. The rumors started to spread pretty fast in the school. Someone claimed that they actually saw police at Mr. Jackson's home, and then they tried to determine why. Then, Many students started talking about how Mr. Jackson was pretty creepy or something about him was off. Then there were rumors that some students came forward with certain claims. And then the local news and letters sent home to our parents confirmed that this wasn't the rumor, but the truth. The rest of this was information that I either got from the news, my parents, or people around the school. He was charged with multiple things and went to prison that I knew. But then I learned that when the girl was confronted, she told her parents and authorities what happened and multiple other girls came forward with claims as well. They also mentioned that there were multiple tapes found with not only similar things to what I saw, but others where he seemed to stalk the girls. I was also friends with a guy whose sister actually came forward which made me feel like all the other claims were true too. I mean, there was physical proof of one, and he was brave enough to keep it at school, so I absolutely believe that there would be more than just one of them. The first girl that I saw in the video stopped going to our school, and I learned that she was homeschooled. Sometimes, I wanted to stop by her home to see how she was doing, 
but I didn't want to worry her or her family when a strange guy showed up. Obviously, this has been many years ago and we've all since graduated. I don't know whatever happened to the girl and I don't think that she even knew that I may have been the one that put the whole thing in motion, but I really hope she's doing okay. So, I know it wasn't exactly me that was affected, but it was still pretty terrifying to see, not to mention knowing that I had to have had some impact in changing some people's lives. Who knows how long he may have continued with his horrible acts if I would have kept that to myself. I wanted to share an event that happened to me and my granddaughter at the last place that I lived in. My husband died in a car accident when my daughter was pregnant, so I never got to meet her. But also being an empty nester, I didn't feel right living in our big four-bedroom home alone, and I decided that it was time to downsize. I found a cute little condominium that was only about 20 minutes from my daughter and son-in-law, and it was a good price, so I moved right in. The only thing about it, however, was that it definitely needed a more homely and me touch to it. So, while I made some changes inside with the help of my kids, I also wanted to start up another garden like I had at my old home. My kids helped me put it together when they were younger, which made it all the more special to me. And now, my first granddaughter was now at the age they were, and I wanted to have her help with it if she wanted to. Maggie is like a little mini-me. I helped my daughter and son-in-law take care of her when she was born. I watched her a lot so they could sleep or even just get out for a bit alone. And she loved staying over with me too. So, when I brought up the garden, she was more than willing to help, and my daughter loved the idea. At the time of this event, I was 49, and my granddaughter was 8. She came over with some stuff that they had bought including a small gardening kit, a sun hat, a mat, all of the stuff that she needed. My son-in-law helped me with lining and digging the top part of the dirt, since it was pretty hard and then we did most of the rest. On the day Maggie and I were out back, deciding what we wanted to plant and where, my neighbor Howard had come out back and greeted us. The fences weren't very tall. It came up to about my chest and seemed to more just be to separate the property rather than for privacy. But I didn't mind Howard. I think he was close to my age, maybe a year or two younger but he seemed like a nice guy. He introduced himself when I moved in and even helped my son-in-law fix one of my windows. He stopped and asked what we were up to and then we started talking about the garden for a bit. I noticed he kept looking down at Maggie and I realized that he hadn't met her yet so I introduced them, explaining that she was my granddaughter. So we talked about her for a while, and then we continued on with our plans for the day. Now, Howard also had a small dog, I think a corgi, and there were a few kids in the neighborhood that liked to go over to his place to play with the dog, or I've even seen some kids walking the dog, so he was definitely not unknown to the community and never gave off any weird feelings. In fact, the way he talked to me was very kind and playful in a way when he asked if I was single. I honestly thought that he may have even been flirting with me. It had been some time since my husband has passed away, so I didn't dislike the attention either. I started catching Howard outside on multiple occasions when Maggie and I were out there and we'd start chatting for a while while we were. The conversations were always friendly and innocent, and we all had a good time. Maggie even offered him some lemonade when we were taking a break. I didn't start to notice something was off until a little further into our garden work. 
Howard was starting to show up every time we were out there, and it was fine at first. But he would start talking to Maggie, distracting her, which caused her to knock some things over before as well. There were also a few times where Maggie wasn't with me, and I had gone out back to mow or do weed, and he would show up again. The conversation at that point, though, would be brief. It was a quick, how's it going? Then he would ask me about Maggie, and when I would mention that she wasn't with me, the conversation would end pretty quickly, and he would leave. I started catching on to this, and I wasn't really a fan of it. I felt bad because I started limiting how much Maggie would do. We didn't have much left, but we were planting the last of the seeds when he came over. And that's when I instructed Maggie to go inside and then clean up. I could see his attention shift to her as she walked in, and our conversation became pretty dull, and he eventually walked off. This happened a few times, and I don't know if he caught on to what I was doing or if he just gave up, but he started coming around less and less. There was one week that Maggie was going to be staying with me, and she was enjoying the sprinkler that I had set up to water the garden. So, I bought something similar to set up for her to play in. While she was changing into her swimsuit, I went out front to get the mail. On my way, I saw my neighbor across the way was out there, and we had began talking about random things. At one point, I turned back to look at my condo, when I saw Howard walking back from his driveway and into his house. My first thought was, great, he's going to ruin something that I had planned for Maggie. I knew she was still inside waiting for me though, so I finished my conversation with my neighbor, and then I started walking back towards my door. I don't know what it was or how to explain it, but, but I felt the need to walk over to Howard's side and see if he was outside. While we had the wall-like fences out back, they went as far as the condo. The front of them either had a small half-brick wall or nothing separating them, so I could easily walk over on his side of my property. I could hear him laughing, so I knew he was out back. This immediately made me feel uncomfortable because I had a feeling that Maggie was probably already out back as well even though I told her to wait for me. Kids are still kids, you know, and she was excited. So, even though I shouldn't have, I went to open his gate and to my disgust, I saw him standing at the fence looking into my yard with his pants down. I immediately yelled at him, none of which were nice words or words Maggie probably ever heard me say, but it was enough to make him stumble and trip as he tried to pick his pants up and then go inside. I immediately ran into my home to find Maggie out back, looking around confused. I asked her what she was doing, and she explained that she was trying to bring the sprinkler outside for me to help when Howard showed up. While she was grabbing the hose, he told her how to hold it up in the air to make it look like it was raining, to which she did. I was disgusted, and I was trying to keep calm in front of Maggie. She could already tell something was wrong by the way she was talking to me. Unfortunately, I had to lie to her and tell her that we couldn't play in the sprinkler because it was going to storm, and instead, I suggested that we make homemade popsicles inside, which seemed to cheer her up. While she was getting started, I called the police in the leasing office to tell them what I just witnessed. The police came over and took down the information. However, they said they couldn't do much since he was on his own property and I had opened the gate, but they said that if it happened again and anyone else witnessed it, to call them back so they can try to get him for indecent exposure. The leasing office apologized and said that they would talk to him, but said that they couldn't keep him from being in his backyard. It was like they missed the entire point. He was invading my space by looking over and doing what he was doing. So I asked them if I could put up a taller privacy fence, and they refused. 
They said that it had to stay uniform and there would be too many steps to try and get the people or businesses that actually own the place to pay for the changes. That told me that they weren't even willing to try. I had just moved into this place a few months ago and now I no longer felt safe there or at least didn't feel safe having my granddaughter there. I told my daughter and son-in-law about the incidents too. They too were torn. None of us wanted this guy anywhere near Maggie. And it broke my heart. I know Maggie was upset about it. But when she came over, she wasn't allowed to go out back. And she could only go out front if someone was with her. I didn't even like her staying the night. So if anything, I stayed the night with them when they needed a babysitter. Howard didn't even try to show his face around after that. And it wasn't even just around me. People saw the cops at my home that day, and I wasn't going to keep that information to myself. I told anyone and everyone I could about him, and just from word of mouth, he was shunned pretty hard. The other kids were not allowed to be around him, and when he went out front, you could see the other parents or grandparents pulling their kids to the other side of them. It must have gotten to him because within that same year, he moved out. I saw moving trucks and I couldn't be more relieved. And once he was gone, I let Maggie stay the night, have friends over, and even play out back and enjoy the hard work that she put into that garden with me. I lived there for a few years, but over time, I learned the leasing people were not as nice as they appeared to be when I moved in and they were not giving me any reason to make me reconsider. But now, I live in a small house with my own yard and a privacy fence, and I will never let something like that happen ever again, because next time, Grandma might have to use something other than her words. And here's the riddle for this video. Hello everyone, it's your creepy sister here. Thank you so much for watching the video. I really appreciate each and every one of you. But I would also like to thank my amazing patrons, my top tippers, and my dearest channel members. Thank you very, very much. I really appreciate it with all of my heart. If you want to support the channel further, you could also choose to become a patron, a tipper, or a channel member. But remember, it's appreciated, but never a requirement. I would also like to announce that we have merch now. The link is in the description of the video, along with all my other social media links, like my Discord server, Twitter, Instagram, and others. You can connect with me and send your stories there. And don't forget to like and subscribe if you haven't yet, and comments are highly appreciated. And remember, your fear feeds me.